Good morning, and thank you for staying for the ministry meeting, and hope that uh, the words that we will read from Scripture and uh, the focus that we'll have today will be encouraging to you. Um, Also, uh, for those watching online, uh, whether now or uh, later, um, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, take an interest in this in this message. And so, I want to talk today about the cost of worship and specifically about worship. And before we read um, eight verses in Scripture, I want to just kind of refocus our minds and our thoughts and our hearts on what is worship, because that's a word that in Christianity is um, used quite a bit, and there's a wide range of different things that could be considered worship. And the first thing to consider is where does this word really come from? And it comes from actually the idea of worship, meaning that the object of the worship is worthy or it's worth uh, the, the worth of that being, in this case, God the Father in heaven or the Lord Jesus Christ, that that worship, that it, that person merits that, um, that favor. And so... We have praise and worship music that we hear on the radio. And we have different verses in our Bible that talk about worship and and what does it really mean. And so, just by way of introduction, the word worship means to display reverence and adoration to a supernatural being. That's That's one of the definitions for worship. But what I want to talk about today is the cost of worship and specifically an act of worship that is well known in the scripture in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And if you um, want to um, just listen, or if you want to read along, um, this is the story of Mary and the expensive box of, of perfume that she broke and anointed the Lord. So John chapter 12, and I'll just read the um, first eight verses of this story. And that will be our focus today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So there's a lot going on in these eight verses. The location, the the people, the guests at this dinner, the act that Mary performed in front of everyone, the after effects of that, her motivation for doing so, and what are the applications that we can use for ourselves today in 2017 as Christians as it relates to our relationship with God. And I started to say before that there's all different kinds of ways to display worship. This morning, just in our... um, worship meeting in our Breaking of Bread meeting, we uh, prayed audibly, some people prayed silently, we sang hymns, even participating in the emblems was an act of worship, so there are many different things that we can do. I mentioned music and and singing, and um, certainly not just the hymns that are in the Believer's Hymn Book, while those are beautiful, but there are many um, different types of um, praise and worship music, and some People like to connect and and worship God um, through nature, meaning that if you go on a walk or to a park or to a state park and and you're just really connecting with the beauty of creation and that you can connect with God and worship Him um, in in that way for being the Creator. But I was also thinking about giving. When we give, um, whether it's to the assembly or to the Lord's work or to a work, um, a, a missionary, that that's an act of, of worship. Um, serving others is an act of worship. Also, interestingly, um, the way that you choose, the way that I choose 
to what I choose to take into my body through my eyes and my ears and my mouth is an act of worship. And that sounds really strange, but Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your act of true spiritual worship. And so the decisions that I make um, about um, whether I'm going to participate in a certain activity or whether I'm going to make this decision or that decision as it relates to whether or not that's, that has an impact on me presenting my body as a living sacrifice to God, that's a way that I can show worship to God. So there's all of these different ways that we can worship. It's not anything that we want to put into a box and say, well, this is the right way to worship and this is the wrong way to worship. And I think that when we become dogmatic about that, that then that becomes something that divides instead of unites um, Christians in the world. Um, and so we want to be focused on the scriptures. And so that's why this example that is before us is so interesting to me about what Mary did um, at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to start by talking a little bit about the background of this situation because sometimes if you're like me, I find I fall into the trap of reading a passage or a section of scripture and just reading for the sake of reading so I can feel like I read something for the day and you don't really dig down into the roots of what is going on here and what is the significance of what is happening here. So I want to give you the background. John, this is John chapter 12, verse 1. If you think, whenever I say John 11.35, what do you think of? John 11.35. Some of you remember that that's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So John 11.35, that's the chapter that precedes this story. The reason that Jesus was weeping is because he's standing at the grave, the tomb of Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days. So the context of this story is that this is not very long after the Lord Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And you see, we'll get to a minute who the guests were at this table, but Lazarus is one of the guests that's reclining at the table with the Lord Jesus. So the background, first of all, is, is that this happened shortly after Lazarus was raised from the dead. Mary and Martha were all upset. They said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And all of the things that happened in that little story in John chapter 11. Another thing that I found interesting is, is that this happened in Bethany. We get that from the first verse that we read together. And so Bethany is only two miles away from Jerusalem. And it's on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And it says six days before the Passover. And so that means that the next day was the day when the Lord Jesus was going to ride into Jerusalem. The next day after this, this supper, probably the next morning or the next afternoon, he rides in on that colt. And the people lay down the palm branches. They lay down their garments and they say, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so... There's two things about that. Number one, he enters Jerusalem, and the, when he left Jerusalem six days later, he had a cross on his back, and he was walking up to Calvary. And so we're going to talk about the urgency of the opportunity to worship, because this was the last time that the Lord Jesus was going to be in Bethany. He was passing through on his way to Jerusalem. The very next day, he would ride in to Jerusalem on that colt. And so... That's a little bit about the background of the, the context of when this took, took place. But I also want you to think about where it took place. And it took place at the house of Simon the leper. So I want to talk a little bit about, we, we can see that um, if, we, if we do a little bit of math, that there were at least 17 people at this dinner counting the Lord Jesus and counting the 12 disciples. So... It's a big dinner, and it's at the house of Simon the leper. And I found that interesting. You know, um, it's, sometimes people become known for something that they do. And so it's sort of like Bill the plumber, okay, Bob the builder, all right? So we have things that are attached to certain names of, of uh, people in life, and it's um, almost synonymous with what they do and who they are. And this man is referred to in three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and um, John, as Simon the leper. 
And so I have to believe, and I, and I looked, and I may, may be wrong, and someone can correct me on this, but I don't really read the story of when this specific um, person, Simon the leper, was, was healed. But I have to believe that he was in a healed state post-healing from the Lord Jesus Christ at this dinner. That these people are not sitting around this big table or reclining, um, more so as, as the, the picture that we have in our day and age is at a table with chairs and silverware. But really, at that time, they would, would spread out maybe some, some kind of um, blanket or something on the ground, and many times they would be sitting on the floor. Um, we read about Lazarus reclining um, at the table. We read sometimes about, uh, once about John, um, and he has his head on the chest of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so sometimes when we see those paintings of the Last Supper, and they're at a big table with their chairs, maybe that happened, but not necessarily. As far as the customs of the day, they may have all been sitting on the floor. And so Simon the leper, he's known in the community as Simon the leper. And that just reminded me that the Lord Jesus Christ that it didn't matter who the person was, that he was going to interact with that person. And especially lepers, because it's one thing if the Lord Jesus Christ talks to a prostitute and forgives her of her sins. It's one thing if he talks to a man that's laying there for however many years, 38 years, that's paralyzed. But when you talk to a leper, and you're close enough to a leper, in that day and age, you could get leprosy yourself. The Lord Jesus could talk to different people, um, people that were drunk, people that were possessed with demons, and maybe it wasn't going to have an effect on him or on his disciples. But leprosy, in my view, is, is kind of in its own category because it was so contagious. They would put the people out of the city and they would live in a leper colony. If they came near the people, they would have to put a garment over their face and they would have to shout um, that they, leper, leper, that they were coming nearby so that the people could move the other direction. But instead of moving the other direction, the Lord Jesus goes to this man's house. So to me, it's very interesting that that's where the dinner takes place. But what about Martha? We know a little bit about her from the story of when the Lord Jesus was at the house of Martha and Mary, the same two people. And Mary is at the feet of the Lord Jesus, and Martha is busy in the kitchen. And Mary, excuse me, Martha gets a little upset and she says to the Lord, don't you care that I'm doing all the work and my sister's sitting here doing nothing? And the Lord says that she has chosen that good thing. Um, and so we, we understand from that that hospitality is important, but that we also learn from the story of Martha and Mary and there's been books written, are you a Martha or are you a Mary? And I think the whole idea is are we too busy in life with all of the things that we have to do? Um, making a meal is something that we have to do. If we, don't, if we don't eat, if we don't sleep, there are certain things that we have to do or we just won't survive. But in life, we have to go to work, we have to do different things, but we still can get so busy with all of the things around us that we don't have time for the Lord Jesus and we don't have time for worship. And I think that that's probably a problem for all of us. And so Martha is there. And it says interestingly in our passage that we read in verse 2, what was Martha doing? It says Martha served. So here she is again with that hospitality attitude, that servant's heart that she's serving, perhaps by herself. In that day and age, you don't read often or ever about all of the men on this list. If there's 17 people at this meal, there's uh, 15 men and two women. You don't really read about the men doing the, the cooking and the cleaning up um, in, that, in that culture at that time. And so, again, Mary, we're going to read, is going to do something that is going to display her act of worship. Maybe Martha is the only one in the kitchen, again, making a meal for 17 people. So um, Martha is there. So interesting to me that Lazarus is there. And there was more than one occasion when the Lord Jesus would raise someone from the dead, and I believe it was when um, the, the little girl he raised from the dead, the first thing he said was, give her something to eat. That the Lord Jesus would, uh, and also don't forget that when he raised himself from the dead, that there were occasions where he would eat food with his disciples, and I don't think that was by accident. I think that when you have someone 
that is raised from the dead, especially in that day and age, everyone just assumed it was a spirit or an apparition or a ghost. And the Lord Jesus wanted to make sure that the people knew, no, this little girl, that's the same little girl that died. She can eat food, she can breathe, she can walk around. Lazarus, he was there and he was eating food because he was still Lazarus. He was that, that same person, but the Lord had brought him back to life. And so I find it interesting that in John chapter 11, Lazarus is dead in the tomb and everyone's talking about how much he stinks. And then in John chapter 12, he's reclining at a table eating food in the presence of the Lord Jesus and the disciples. That's something that only the Lord Jesus can do. But we don't want to just gloss over that and zoom right past it when we consider who was at this dinner. And we also have the disciples at the dinner. And so... These disciples included, as we read a little bit later, Judas Iscariot. It included his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Um, These men who were of all walks of life, that left their nets behind and became fishers of men, that were tax collectors and left that life behind and dropped everything and followed, followed the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were there with him as well. But they were also only less than a week away from some big decisions that they were going to make. And the outcome of that moment of truth was they all forsook him and fled. And I'm talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. So as close as they were to him now, and as close as they were to him even uh, five or six days later during that Passover meal in the upper room, that before the week is out, it will be said of them, they all forsook him and fled. The disciples were at this dinner as well. And also, we have Mary. And so, we're going to talk a little bit more about her. She's kind of the focus of this, um, this message. Um, she was there as well. But the, the second thing that I wanted to just add about the guests at the, the dinner and the wide range of backgrounds that these people had is I am so impressed with how accessible the Lord Jesus Christ was during His public ministry. And... That is something that still applies today because it said in, it says in Scripture that at the moment that he cried, it is finished, that the veil in the temple in Jerusalem was torn from the top to the bottom, that nine-inch thick veil that symbolized that you can't go from here into there in the Holy of Holies. The symbolism of that being torn is, is that now we have access to God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so access or accessibility to this one who's sitting at a table and is just, is just there. They can touch him. They can talk to him. They can ask him questions. And I was thinking about this even more when I was preparing for this because of a story that I heard. I read this online, and I don't even know how I came across it. It doesn't really matter. But there was a couple. This is back in October of last year in New York City. And there's a lot, and there's a lot of walking in New York City or cabs. A lot of people don't have um, their own cars. But this couple... They were, they were doing okay financially, and so um, they had a favorite restaurant that they'd eaten at a few times before, and I don't remember the name of it, but they were going to walk and have dinner. They had reservations. They had made the reservations three months prior for that night in October to get into that certain restaurant. And so they're walking, and it's a nice evening in October in New York City, and as they get closer, they see a lot of, um, they see a lot of lights, uh, flashing lights, uh, like police cars and different things, and they get about three blocks from the restaurant, and there's a security checkpoint that they have to go through. So they figure, well, this is a pretty fancy restaurant. Maybe it's somebody important. Maybe it's the governor. Maybe it's Mayor Bloomberg that is at this restaurant. And, of course, there's a lot of restaurants between three blocks and their destination, so it could have been any of the restaurants. They don't really think much of it. But as they get closer and closer, one block away, they go through another security checkpoint, And then when they get to the door of their restaurant, then they go through another security. And I'm talking the wand and all of the different things to make sure that they don't have a weapon. And then the wife happens to catch a glimpse of the presidential seal on the side of one of the big limousines. And so she knows that at that time in October, that President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama are eating at this restaurant. So they're all excited. And so they get in there, and the place is all kind of humming and buzzing about the fact that the president is there. But he's not sitting in the main dining area. He and his wife and whoever they were um, eating dinner with were back in a uh, private room 
with lots of security in front of it. And then everybody stuck around. I don't think that restaurant made as much money and as much turnover as they had hoped that evening because everyone was waiting around for him to leave, hoping to get a glimpse. And on this story, then, there was a little photo that was posted, and it's just this blurry image from far away of the side of uh, President Obama's head as he's walking quickly out of the restaurant. And so I tell you that story to compare that to the accessibility of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I understand, I'm not being critical of, of the President and his need for security or any dignitary that in this day and age, as Frank was telling us about the world, um, that they would need security. But my point is, is that if that couple had just thought, you know what, I have a question for the President, and decided that they wanted to walk over and, and walk up to that private room and say, um, I'd like to talk to the President, that we know what would have happened. Maybe kindly, maybe not so kindly, they would have been told no and told to go back to their seats. And so the accessibility of someone important today and the accessibility of the most important person who ever walked the face of the earth then is interesting to me. And the application, again, is that we have access. We have access that our worship to praise the one who is worthy of our worship can happen at any time, anywhere. It can happen at a stoplight. It can happen in the shower. It can happen wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that we have the opportunity to worship him. But then, with all of these other things about singing or giving or serving others or even the decisions I make about my body being a living sacrifice, all of those things all day long are my acts of worship. And they are noticed, they are appreciated, they are well received by the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the next thing that I do want to talk about is probably the most important part of this message, and that's the act of worship that Mary did, this very noticeable act of worship that Mary did when she broke this box and then anointed the Lord's feet with this. But to try and apply this to our own worship and how perhaps we can have more of a sense of urgency, more of an understanding of why it's important and something that we can try to do more of in our life. And so when we come to the first um, point, I wanted to talk for a moment about Mary's past and Mary's track record. And what I'm getting there, getting at there is just simply the story that we know about her when she made a choice instead of helping in the kitchen that she was sitting at the disciples at, at the Lord's feet and she was listening to his teaching. And so again, um, just to touch on it briefly, is that she had a track record or a habit of putting herself in a position where this environment was conducive to worship. And so let's again, might be a little bit of a stretch, but let's apply that to today. Do I put myself into situations that are conducive to worship? There's research now about how few moments, how few, how, how few seconds there are in a day when we're awake, when there is not sound that we hear. Quiet is one of the most sought-after commodities in the world. And people more and more are taking trips to places where they can get away from the hustle and bustle and the noise. And part of that is because of our smartphones and, of course, the, the media and the banner ads and the, the electronic billboards that change every eight seconds when you're at a stoplight. And sometimes you drive down the um, main uh, thoroughfare of a community and it I've never been to Vegas, but I've seen pictures, and it looks like you're kind of on the Vegas Strip with all the different um, digital signs and all the flashing lights. And so when do we have that time to intentionally make ourselves be in a place that is conducive to worship? And I'm not saying that you can't worship the Lord while you're driving to work or even listening to a song on the radio, but I just see this example of Mary that her track record was that she was quiet and she was at the disciples' feet, while the contrast that was here for us intentionally in Scripture is her sister who was very busy with what was before her. I think the lesson we learn is, is that if we try to make sense of that and try to make decisions about 
the importance of all of the commotion before us and try to be intentional about being quiet and being at the Lord's feet um, in, in the ways that we can be. But the interesting thing that I see here, too, is the urgency of, um, of worship. And I said before that in less than a week, or, or the very next day that the Lord Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem, and in about a week He was going to be hanging on the cross. So we know for a fact that He was never coming back to Simon the leper's house for dinner. This was her last opportunity. She may not have known that. She probably didn't know that. To worship the Lord in the way that she did with this box of ointment. And so, that has to do with the urgency of worship. And I'll speak for myself and say that I don't put urgency on worship as much as I should. And I'll give you a couple of things that might get our minds thinking along these lines of how important this is. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson is a poet, was a poet, and one of the things that he said is that if the stars were only visible one night every thousand years, everyone on earth would stay up all night and look at the stars. But because they're out every night, we don't look up as often as we should. I'm, you know, I don't know exactly the, the, the quote, but that's, you get the idea. That imagine, if just, and let's not say in a thousand years, let's just say in a hundred years. And so the odds are that once in your lifetime, once in my lifetime, that there would be one night, we would be checking the weather forecast, because if it was cloudy where we lived, we would be sure that we're driving someplace so that we can see these stars. We would be planning. We would be staying up all night. It would be this unbelievable light show once in our lifetime. But there's probably, this has probably happened to you. It happens to me sometimes. Monday night at our house is garbage night. And we live out um, away from a lot of the light. And some of you probably live even further from the, the, um, a lot of lights from a shopping center or whatever. And sometimes I'll just be busy, you know, doing the thing with the garbage. And you just sort of stop. And you look up and you notice the stars. And it's amazing. Um, and especially after your eyes adjust to the dark and how many stars you can see. And so my point is is that I, I know that I take that for granted because it's there all the time. And God is there all the time. He's there for us to worship whenever we can fit Him in to our schedule. The Lord Jesus is there for us to worship whenever we can fit Him in. And so there's this urgency that was on the, the mind, perhaps, of, of Mary when she took that, ch that chance, that opportunity, that moment to do something that made an impression on the Lord Jesus Christ, most importantly, but on everyone else that was there. And we don't worship for the impact that it has on everyone else. I appreciate when brethren get up and pray, or if I'm at a conference and brethren get up and pray, or one of the preachers get up and pray, and it's like, wow, that prayer really helped me focus on the Christ as Redeemer or that He's the Lamb of the Old Testament. And so other people's prayers do help my worship. But when I pray in morning meeting, I'm not really trying to, um, hopefully, not trying to impress other people or you know get other people to listen to what I'm saying. And so we, we know that, I believe that Mary's heart wasn't when she did what she did wasn't for everybody else. It was her, her focus was the Lord Jesus Christ. What can I do that will show Him how I actually feel on the inside? And so that's where we come to probably the most important part of this message is the cost of her worship. And so in our scripture, it tells us when Judas is um, really upset that she did this, he says, well, why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And we know that he didn't care. He just wanted 300 denarii in the bag so that he could do something with that money. And so she takes this, and it says that it was a pound of pure nard. And when you do a little uh, looking as to what nard was, and it's something that's still available today, um, it's something that's an export mainly from northern India, 
and it's a perfume. It smells like gladiolas. I don't know what gladiolas smell like. It's red in color, but the most um, the most noteworthy thing about pure nard is that it's very expensive. If you wanted a pound of pure nard today, you would pay between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars U.S. for a pound of pure nard, and so that's pretty expensive perfume. Sixteen ounces of of that would be around twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. And so the way, and I'm sure you've heard this before as you've read this story in Matthew, Mark, and in John, that that was a year's wages for a typical person in age. A year's wages. And so I want you to think about that for a minute and think about um, what you make in a year or what your combined family income is for a year, let's say. And I know that that would be a really hard thing for me to take that and have that be something that was given in an act of worship. But for Mary, and as I looked into this, it wasn't just about the fact that she did something that was expensive. It was the fact that the cost to her was twofold. Number one, it was this was probably something that was given to her as a gift. And so it was very, very valuable. And so by breaking it and it going all over the Lord's feet, there's no way to, to pick that back up and to have a fourth of it so that she could sell it for, um, you know, 75 or 50 denarii or whatever. It was gone. It was all spent on him, which is part of the point. We'll get to that in a minute. But the other thing that I found is that this was most likely her dowry for her first year of marriage. And so you might remember that in Leviticus, one of the laws at that time was um, that during the first year of marriage, um, that a man shall not be charged with any of the king's work, neither shall he go out to war for that first year of marriage. And so in that era, one of the things that was a common practice was that gifts were given to a woman, and it was her dowry, and things were saved by a man, or gifts were given to him, and that then they used that combined wealth, this pound of nard and other things, to maintain their, their lifestyle to buy food and what have you, for that first year of marriage so that the man didn't have to work or go off to war or do work for the king. And so, um, you know, we can have we could have all kinds of conversations about what that would be like as far as the divorce rate if the first year of marriage that, that they didn't have, that no one had to work and that um, you could just spend time with each other and building the relationship and all that kind of stuff. But what we do know is that was the custom of that culture at the time. And so by her breaking that box of nard on the, on the Lord's feet, she was also paying a price in that she became much less desirable for her to be married because she didn't have a dowry. And so she might have also cost herself a, a husband, or at least a husband in the near future, because a husband, um, we, we talk in this in our culture, there's, there's dating, and there's falling in love, and then there's getting married. And in those cultures, most things were business transactions. They were arrangements that were made. They weren't two people that fell in love, and we love each other, and we're going to get married. That's not how it was then. And so my point is is that without the dowry, she was likely costing herself a husband at least for a period of time until she was able to get a dowry. So what does that have to do with us. In Philippians chapter um, 4, I believe it is. Um, I didn't write the reference down, but I'm just going to read the verse. Verses 7 and 8. It's Philippians 3 or 4. Paul is speaking. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the, sur- the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. So, so Paul, who had this long resume of all the things that he was and had, he counts them all as loss, and he compares that on one side of the balance scale, and the other side is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's saying this is more valuable to him. And then he says in verse 7, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. And so Mary certainly showed us something about the cost of worship when she uh, broke that box of perfume on the Lord's feet. 
And so I have to ask myself that question is, what does worship cost me? What is, what is the price that I pay to worship? And we know that in some countries that the price that they pay is very steep, um, that it's illegal to hold church services. And of course, as you know, I work in a Jewish day school, and um, not this past week, but the week before, was Yom HaShoah, which is the, the day that they remember, the, that the Jewish people remember the Holocaust. And we have a dinner where survivors come and they tell their story. We have a ceremony where um, we, we uh, have some candles that are lit, and there are people that tell their stories about surviving the Holocaust. And so if you think about what you know and that you learned in school about 6 million Jews perishing in the Holocaust and really 12 million people overall because of Christians and gypsies and homosexuals and African Americans were also killed in the Holocaust. That to be a Jew in the 1930s and 1940s, the cost that you paid for your belief in God was that you lost your life. And so... We know that in our society, in our world, I should say today, in 2017, that there's still people that their cost of worship is high. And that doesn't mean that just because we live in America that, you know, it it doesn't cost us anything. Um, it, It costs us time. It could cost us money. It could cost us a relationship with someone. It could impact our reputation at work to be a Christian. It certainly would cost us worldly pleasures if we're making good decisions about what we take into our bodies so that our bodies can be a living sacrifice to God. And so there are things that it costs us. Costs us. Um, Is it going to cost me my life? Probably not. Um, I have it pretty easy living in America being a Christian. And I'm thankful for that. But then to me that also makes me feel like well then I have a great responsibility. And I immediately thought of the parable of the ten talents. And so, if we're given much, then much is expected in return. And so, um, if we are in a country where worship is legal and available, and there are things to help us worship, if we Google devotionals, or if we turn on um, any device or the radio and can listen to praise and worship music, we have this bountiful blessing of opportunities to worship God And understandably and admittedly, all of the commotion of daily life keeps us, keeps me from worshiping Him like I should at His feet. So then, quickly, the next uh, thing that I want to talk about is her attitude. And the attitude, in my mind, has all to do with the fact that she broke it instead of pouring it. If she had poured it out onto the Lord's feet, she could have poured out They say that a few drops would have filled that whole house. We read that the fragrance filled the whole house. A few drops of that, it's so strong, it would have gotten the job done. But she broke it, and all of the nard, all of the perfume went all over the Lord Jesus. And so her attitude was that she was just, in my opinion, overcome with the desire to worship Him. She wasn't counting the cost. She wasn't thinking about how much this box of ointment cost. She was just fully focused and interested in worshiping the Lord Jesus. And she held nothing back. And her attitude was she she broke the box. And her humility. um, We see that she took the low place. um, And she was on her hands and knees. And it made me think about the Lord Jesus washing the disciples' feet about six days later in that upper room. And the humility and the low place that we have to take because in my life, if I start thinking that it's me and that, well, this is going really well at work or this is going really well in in this part of my life and it's because I've planned well and because I've got these skills and all that kind of stuff, then I'm not practicing humility. I'm relying on my own abilities and talents and not relying on the Lord. And we all know how that usually goes. Usually something comes in that reminds us that it's not about what we're capable of. It's about us depending on Him. She demonstrated humility. Also, her reputation, um, it was considered scandalous for any man other than her husband to see a woman with her hair down in that culture. She put her hair down and she wiped the Lord's feet with her hair. And so, her reputation 
not only from the fact that, just if you think about it, the people who were there or the people that heard about it, the people that walked into Simon the leper's house three weeks later and it still smelled like this perfume and he told the story about what happened, that her reputation in that community was affected by what she did. Now, the people who were Christians and very devoted to the Lord, they would have probably seen that as, wow, that was really amazing. But to most people, they would have been like Judas or worse as far as the attitude that they had about what she had done. Also, the effect that it had on people, we read that the aroma filled the house and that everyone smelled it. And so sometimes our worship can have an effect. We're not supposed to really worry about that, about how it affects other people. But if we live our life with a mindset of worship, then we can certainly have an, set an example for others, whether it be our family members or our children, as to what that looks like. And then the criticism. Of course, the criticism came from Judas. Um, and that was foolish. That was a waste of money. And if an act of worship is to give a certain amount of money to the assembly or to a, to a missionary or to a couple or a family that's in need, um, and there's criticism from some source, maybe it's from a spouse, maybe it's from your, your parents, um, whatever it might be, that um, sometimes worship will have criticism attached to it. And there are probably some people in your life that think that there are better ways for you to spend your time than to come to meetings and to do all of the things that you do as part of the assembly. But if those people, if you listen to those people, which you don't, then um, maybe it would change um, what you do. But the point is, is that um, anything that we do that's devotion to God in this world will probably be criticized. And so we just accept that and we move on. And it's part of the cost. So just to conclude and to wrap this up, um, I wanted to talk briefly about the Lord's response. And it's interesting to me what he said to her. And I like the way that, um, of course, this is um, recorded. This is recorded in three different Gospels. And I'm just going to read Ma uh, Mark 14, verse 6 to 9. Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before my burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ saying that about someone. She did something, and he said to everyone in that room, and he's speaking to Judas, but he said to everyone that... Whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, over the next 2,000 years after his death, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that's true. We're still talking about it right now. And I also thought about the widow's two mites, where it says she gave all that she had. The Lord Jesus said she did, she did what she could. Leave her alone. And so um, there's the urgency there, too. You always have the poor with you, but you... Don't always, you won't always have me with you. So just the, the kind of the um, bringing some of those points together in um, the way that the Lord Jesus said um, to leave her alone and that she has done a beautiful thing to me. And it was a beautiful thing. So then the, the thing that I always like to finish with then is, is what's the application and what's next for us if we want to have the mindset of worship that Mary displayed when she broke that box of ointment on the Lord's feet. And so the first thing is, I think, to have a servant's heart, to have that low place, to have that mindset to serve first. And that if we have that low place, that place of a servant, um, and that it's the, the why is more important than the how. And what I'm getting at is when it comes to worship, there's a lot of this now in business, and there's a very famous TED Talk. The man's name is Simon Sinek, and he talks about um, leading with the why instead of the how. Um, and that's something that's very common now in, in business and in organizations about people don't care about what you do. They care about your passion and your purpose and why you do it. And if you have a strong enough why, the what and the how will work itself out because the why is what drives everything. 
And so what I'm applying that to, because I have some, I, I believe some of that to be very true, is when it comes to having a servant's heart, why? Why do I want to have a servant's heart? Is, is it because I'm just checking off a to-do list of things that I'm supposed to do? Or is it because I truly have a heart where I want to be like the ultimate servant, the Lord Jesus Christ? And if that's my motivation, then I'll serve and I won't keep track in a little black book. I'll just do it because I want to do it. And that is truly having that low place in that servant's heart and that our attitude drives our actions. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to be connected. And I was thinking about, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And we know that when that little branch or that that weed or that vine that we we cut it off, um, that we come back a day later and it's all brown and withered because it's not connected to the vine. And so I think that we need to be intentional about making those connections. And again, the application of how busy our lives are and how much we have going on that if we don't stay connected to Him through the Word and through prayer and through just considering Him and meditating upon Him, that we're going to wither and we're going to be dry and we're going to feel stale and we're going to be caught up in all of the things that are in the world that don't refresh us like the Lord Jesus Christ does. And then the last one is to be open. And to be open means to be open to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a living part of the Trinity of the Godhead that is in us. When we were saved, we became a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. And to be willing to be guided, to be convicted, to be led, to to read the Scriptures and have that inspired Word of God be illuminated to us and then to follow what the Scriptures say is that we have to be open to that instead of me thinking I have all of the answers and I've got this plan and I've got this three-point plan, and if I do this and do this, then in a year I'll be here, and this is where I want to be. That's what society tells us to do, and there's nothing wrong with planning. That's important. But when it comes to our why and to our spiritual life, we need to have that attitude of Mary that we're just compelled to worship. But I don't think that that just happens. It happens because she had already developed a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we look at the sense of ur- this with a sense of urgency and we consider the different things that we've read today and that attitude that Mary had, that maybe it will affect not only our worship, but our intentional efforts to create an environment of worship and to stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we'll have that desire to want to worship Him in a way that He can say that she or He has done a beautiful thing me. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our God and Father in heaven, we give thanks for this opportunity to read once again from the Word of God. And we think of Mary and how she broke this box and held nothing back. And we pray that in our lives, our busy lives, that we would have that desire to live for the Lord Jesus Christ in a way where we hold nothing back, but that He is our Savior and that we will be His servants here upon this earth and that we will use all of our abilities and talents and energy to share the gospel and to bring honor and glory to his name. And we just pray now for the food that's been provided downstairs. We give thanks for it, for those that prepared it, and pray to bless it to our bodies. And just ask to watch over us and bring us back at the next appointed time. We pray all this in the Savior's worthy and precious name.